you you know you were narrating your incidents uh, what re- what i realized was uh, my mom used to tell this to me you know to the, my younger self whatever you have they that's they say amdani athani kharcha rupaya so don't earn a 50 paisa and don't spend a rupee that is going to be a sure shot recipe of disaster because that's when you start getting into borrowing and debt and all of that most people think okay financial independence is it like having 1 crore or 2 crores like how do you put it in numbers so there is no one size fits yeah. all i think uh, kon banega karodpati has uh, made 1 crore like a very big number to absolutely us. <laughs> yeah the top 100 companies by virtue of size yeah. by virtue as we call it the These market like capital reliance and itc that's right yeah. uh, they will have limited elbow room to give you return per return return per return you know kind of a thing A very good afternoon, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today on a sun on a Saturday afternoon, right? And today we have a very special guest with with us. We have Miss Lakshmi Ayer, who is the CEO of Cotec Investment Advisory. Thank you so much for coming here, ma'am. Thank Can you. Can you give us a small introduction about yourself so that people know who we are in the presence of today? Sure. Uh, so uh, thanks, Sharan, for this. Uh, my name is Lakshmi. Uh, I have just moved uh, into the capacity of uh, the ceo of investment and strategy at kotak investment advisors uh, prior to this i worked for what 20 years 22 years with kotak asset management company as um, a cio where i used to lead the fixed income piece uh, onshore and offshore yeah. um, and also oversee the uh, product role so the entire business uh, product vertical folded into me got it so basically what has happened is now ma'am some of the things have gone over our head right from what you uh-huh. said So we need to kind of deep dive now. Uh-huh. So I I thought the best way to do that is kind of to ask you uh what does a day in your life look like? Now I'm sure your days keep changing every day because mm. you are the CEO after all. Mm-hmm. So can you kind of maybe um give us a general essence of what does um a life or your life look like from a professional standpoint? Right. Uh um, what you do on a day-to-day basis? Mm-hmm. What are the d- uh, d- big decisions that you take which impact uh, people's money? Sure. So can you deep dive into that? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh uh how do I earn my daily bread? I think that's very yeah. important and yeah. do I really justify earning my bread? That's also equally important. Uh so I think for starters uh, no day is similar to the other. Uh, very very important because uh uh in some sense uh, the dynamism or uh, the dynamism of the role is what uh, clearly excited me to do what i'm doing today uh how does my day start i start my day pretty early because okay. uh, as time? i s- uh 8:30 8:30 okay. yeah so as a money manager uh, big, uh, you know i used to i i have to track the markets right Uh, so 8:30 you get to work not waking up in the morning no right? no no, no. Uh, that might be a misconception <laughs> among the audience so, i yeah. uh, wake up at 6 o'clock uh, i do a 7 to 8 km walk every day wow. uh, i alternate between walk and yoga okay. and uh, i reach home by about 5 uh, minutes to 8 after okay. whatever i do and 8:30 i'm in office wow uh, okay i am among the so called lucky few in mumbai where i can uh, literally walk down to work okay. if the weather is not so good then i drive down to work uh what do i do usually um uh, my day encompasses a few things one is uh, uh meeting investors uh, is one of the predominant part of my portfolio part of my profile so who uh, are your investors typically so it, i don't think it's the retail investors that you talk so to so right? the investors that i interact with are largely uh, uh, corporates uh hnis which is high net worth individuals uh, family offices that is yeah. uh, the teams that manage monies for big families in india uh, and sometimes even outside of india so these are the kind of people that i interact with predominantly mm. like what is the average uh, ticket size of these individuals who you usually talk to like what kind of money do they how what terms do they talk in like do they ta- talk in lakhs crores 100 crores how do they talk so they talk in lakhs they talks in millions they talk okay. in billions they okay. talk whatever they understand uh, so usually these are investors who have monies uh, you know probably in the range of uh, lower end of 50 100 crores to upper end of maybe 5000 7000 8000 crores so okay. you know a 10 million dollar ticket size to maybe a billion dollar kind of a ticket size okay. uh, again uh, both india india as well as abroad those are the kind of investors that i usually interact with what do i talk to them uh, what do we discuss um, 
well uh, my linkedin profile says that uh, finance food and films in that order but predominantly the discussion is around investments uh, the discussion is on asset allocation which means mm. where should you put your money why should you put your money and most importantly how much should you put your money so mm. that's a very important part of my role uh, I also spend considerable time with my team conceptualizing new strategies. Nice. What kind of new products that we need to offer to the market? Uh, why should you offer it today? Uh, why does an equity make sense today over why should a fixed income be sold? So you know multiple of right. those discussions. Can you can you kind of uh, explain actually what an equity is and what is fixed income? I'm sure most of you all know, but yeah. just to explain all the keywords absolutely so if uh, the very simple example i will give you that if you want uh, you know caffeine boosters or red bull in your portfolio the one which uh, aids you in the wealth creation journey uh, then you have to own more of equities as an asset class which is buying shares right. um, but uh, if you want more of stabilizers like if you want more of the nimbu pani or the lemon water in your portfolio which allows you for some stability in the portfolio but not really help you too much in your wealth creation journey right. it's more of wealth preservation journey then those money is going to fixed income or as you call it in debt in uh, debentures and in non convertible bonds basically that's the diff uh, right. differentiation between the two got it got it so just to summarize you talk to some really rich people on how what they should do with their money and then you tell them where should they invest their money and how much they should invest their money yeah, so and, help them get, and help them get richer and help them get richer absolutely so that is one part of the job is there anything else apart from this yeah so i also uh, you know manage a few of the funds for okay. example uh, you want to invest uh, in equity two types one is uh, there are equities which are listed on the stock exchange right? right bombay stock exchange national stock exchange there are some who are not in the listed space but they are still aspiring to get to there for example mm. um, uh, zomato is a listed company right so we all know swiggy is not listed for right. example but they, but they may be. aspire to yeah. get listed so uh, some of these companies is what we evaluate uh, to be able to make an investment so in the unlisted mm. space so i also manage that fund uh, also um, uh in the bond markets or in the fixed income markets uh you can get uh, you know 7% 8% kind of returns also you can get 13 14 15% kind okay. of returns depending on how much of risk you want to take hmm. so we also i also manage uh, something known as uh, the private credit fund so there is a okay. credit fund so these are funds which take a little bit extra risk okay to be able to give you that extra return so can you uh, define what that extra risk means when you uh, mean private extra risk, risk uh, essentially means that these companies companies may not be like the front line the bluest of bluest chip companies or large cap companies as they call it in terms yeah. of size uh, but these could be the mid market companies which means mm. uh, the size is relatively smaller they may not be listed for example but still the promoter or the owner of the company wants to needs, raise money yeah, yeah wants to raise money for funding his growth plans he wants to um, set up a factory in mumbai or mm. he already has one in mumbai he wants to set up one more it could be any of these reasons right so you require money for that right you have two ways to raise money either you borrow through debt and then you have to service that through interest or you fund it through the equity market routes mm. so we have a fund for that also so again uh, i'm part of that uh, fund management team nice nice so yes, that is so the that is the credit risk debt That's correct. It. Perfect. Perfect. Bang Interesting. on. Interesting. Yeah. So now, before we go ahead, I thought we will do a quick uh, rumor or true segment of mm -hmm. this uh, talk show. Mm -hmm. So I thought I will ask you like around four questions, mm -hmm. and we would like to know whether it's a rumor or true. Okay. Right. So we all know that um, you know uh, finance finance industry is male dominated, mm -hmm. and uh, but is it is it like very tough for a woman to get into the finance industry today? Is that a rumor or is it? rumor it's a rumor yeah okay. because i am part of the financial services fraternity yeah it's not uh, i would say um, it doesn't come very naturally okay but it's not that it's a show stopper or it's very difficult hmm. thoda effort lagta hai you right. have to push yourself right. and tell yourself that look i want to make it and uh, honestly any profession is gender agnostic hmm. and i tell people if i can do it anybody can do it because right. it's not rocket science and i'm right. not a scientist so right. it's a rumor So why do you think that there is uh, so less women in the finance industry because uh, even if i look at my audience on instagram around uh, 20 25% of the audience are women mm -hmm. so what do you think is that gap which exists 
uh, due to which the women participation in finance roles is limited. So, you know, Sharan, my view is the biggest gap is inhibition. Uh, the perception that, oh, you know, it's all male uh, dominated. So what am I or what's in it for me? What am yeah. I going to get to do? I think that's the biggest mental block that most women have. Uh, and I love interacting with students. So for example, right. I'm then pretty much, uh, you said you're from Mangalore, right? right. So I was at uh, Tap Me Institute once mm. again, where I was interacting with students, uh, doing some guest lectures and stuff like that. Uh, there are women and men, obviously, both in the audience. Uh, and... Um, the fear that finance is equal to numbers is something which uh, women think that, oh, you know, numbers don't come naturally to me. Right. Uh, I was, you know, in, as a school student, I used to love math. Hmm. So math used to be my, one of my favorite subjects apart from French and, uh, you know, English. But the point is that numbers came naturally to me. So for me, probably that was a natural affinity. Hmm. But for those who... For those who it's not a natural affinity, I would say, I think it's the biggest mental block you need to shun. Hmm. And when you do that, you realize it's absolutely seamless. Right. So yeah, you have to make the plunge. You don't have a choice. Got it. So the next uh, rumor or true question I wanted to ask you is uh, everybody assumes that people in the finance industry, you know, maybe CAs or CFAs, are good are automatically good at managing their own finances. Is that a rumor or true? Well, I would say the truth lies in between are they geared and qualified to manage their own money? The answer is probably yes. But do they have all the wherewithal and the means to do it? I would say probably not necessary. Because you're so involved in your own uh, per, you know, professional life. You, you're a child accountant or a CFA. So you have a running job day to day. What do you do then? Hmm. Your money takes... Uh, the last priority right. and therefore in that process while you do understand the nuances and how to <coughs> go about doing it the wherewithal to be able to execute it and most importantly with discipline which i think is the most lacking ingredient today when you plan your finances mm. i think that's not available so mm. therefore as i would say right. I, I unfortunately cannot answer it in right. one bucket but right. clearly um, it's it's right somewhere in the between. And, and I think that's true with not just people in the finance profession, with any profession, uh, because people uh, prioritize learning about investing in money once they start making money. Correct. And that is a mistake, I feel, because you have limited time once you start making money because your work priority takes over. Absolutely. So after coming back from work, let's say seven or eight in the evening, most people don't have the bandwidth to, you know, open up, um, uh, let's say, an article um, on, uh, or let's say, any publication related to money management and learn about how to, you know, invest in money in the right places. Absolutely. Most people just learn about taxes, how to save the minimal amount of taxes, and that too through their CA. Uh, but I think most people don't realize that if you actually learn about investing your money, uh, right during your college days, even before you earn. That's what I did, by the way. I, 18 or 19 is when I started learning about money. And when I started earning money, I knew exactly what to do with it. But for most people, it's rocket science. But it's so simple. If you had actually just put in like maybe just 20, 25 hours, you know, let's say over a period of one year, you would have known most 90% of what's there to learn about money management. Yeah, but we all get uh, wise with hindsight, right? So right, that's how right. it works. But yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, our finances do take a back seat. Uh, but uh, it's very, very important to invest hmm. time to manage your own money. Very right. important. Now, the last one I wanted to ask you is, uh, people assume that millennials and Gen Z uh, are, of course, uh, turning out to be a consumerist uh, kind of uh, demographic. Uh, and natural, and as, as, as a byproduct of that, they're not really into investing their money. And they're all about, you know, YOLO, this is my 20s and early 30s. What is the point of investing money if I'm so young? Uh, is that a rumor or true based on what you've seen from a macroeconomic trend? Uh, it's closer to being true. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the the COVID phase actually uh, accentuated the pace of uh, DMAT accounts being opened in the country. Uh, but the Gen Z and the millennials, uh, definitely the Gen Z, uh, is in for instant gratification. Right. For them, investments uh, and Instagram both start with I and have to have the same appeal. Right. So you post a picture and you need likes. You post a reel and you need likes. And you just need it uh, amplified here and now. Investments don't work like that. Right. So it's unfortunately true, closer to being true, I say, because um, the more I interact with students, the more I get convinced that there is that drive now, uh, which mm. is picking up gradually, that they want to obviously build uh, for tomorrow. 
Hmm. Uh, they want to live today, no doubt. Yeah. Even I want to live today. But yeah, you have to plan for tomorrow. Right. And the sooner you decide, maybe you're 17, 18, it's okay, you don't plan. Maybe you're 20, 21, you don't plan. But if you're not, you are going to be your own impediment in hmm. the wealth creation process. It's very right. simple. Because inflation is not going to wait for you and me. That right. is going to keep eating into your returns. Right. So, so be it. So Do, do, you, do you think the dynamics has changed a little bit? Uh, for an, let's say an average 20 year old person, let's say some born in the 70s or the 80s uh, versus an average 20 year old today. <clears throat> and I'm more interested to know about um, how uh, the next 20 years of these two individuals had born during different uh, points of time uh, will look like. Uh, for example, let's say my parents, um, even after, you know, when I turned 20, most of their money was not invested in the right places. Sure. But they're still pretty well off, I would say, because they had investments in real estate and real estate really boomed. Yeah. Uh, but going forward, uh, firstly, the, uh, the, the difficulty of acquiring a real estate property has become, you know, has skyrocketed. Yeah. Um, and that we do, don't really have much idea about the future outlook of real estate, whether it's going to give those 10 next 20 x returns that, that it gave in the past, uh, which took care of our, you know, our parents' uh, wealth. So I'm, I'm, I, I want to understand going forward for an average 20 year old born in today's generation, how difficult it's going to be to plan uh, for a retirement because I feel like it has become a little bit more difficult compared to an average 20 year old born 30, 40 years back. So, you know, Sharon, in fact, I would say that uh, my 20 year self, you know, when I was 20 and today a 20 something, the access to information, the way you can plan in a methodical manner and the infrastructure required to achieve that. Hmm. I think you blend all the three into a jar and lo and behold, you have the perfect recipe. So today right. it's available. Hmm. Those days, A, we didn't have that kind of money. Right. So obviously <laughs> the base or the, uh, you know, the gradient has gone up further. And um, you're right, my parents hardly save for me. Hmm. But I am saving for my son or I'm investing for my son. Hmm. Now it's like the relay race. I mean, he has to take on the baton from me. Right. So he has to decide his richness because my richness, I don't want to transmit to him. I'm very clear about it. Okay. So he okay. has to obviously grow his richness hmm. the way he thinks with all these uh, ingredients available. Hmm. So now it's very clear that uh, you have rava, which is the semolina. And then with that, you have a choice to make it as an upma, which is a savory. Hmm. So you have the salt in it. And then you have a choice to make it a shira, which has a sugar in it. Right. But the ingredient is the same. Right. I find the ingredients available today for this genre is significantly higher. Hmm. And they have access to more information. Hmm. So it can be a boon and a bane. So 20 years back, did we have this podcast facility? The answer is no ways. No, we didn't have it. Today we are educating. So you have you have to take on the baton. Hmm. And not only just take on the baton, I would say you have to pass it on. And that's how hmm. the game of relay is successful. Right. But as I said, uh, the patience levels I see is significantly receding. Hmm. When I say long term, it's like I write six across the table here and you say, oh, it's nine. And I say it's six and both mm. of us are right. Right. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is a game of patience. Mm. This is um, like a game of poker. If you play poker, for example, till the last card, you don't know who's the winner. Mm. And one card can turn the tables. So it's all about longevity. It's about making your decision to invest now. Mm. Because... So if you were yeah. 20 year old today, yeah. what would you do? In from an investment point of view, I would have started my investments much earlier. Much so earlier, I started okay. earning when I was in 12th grade, when I was 18 okay. year old. Wow. Um, I used to teach students. So I enjoy teaching. So I used to teach students and I got paid for it. And I said, wow, this is the best profession that one can do. It didn't pay me enough. So then I had to get, right. get into finance. But the point is that um, that uh, that kick of earning and that kick of being financially independent happened to me at the age of 18. Insignificant mm. amount, but enough to take care of my jeb kharchi, as they say, the pocket money. Yeah. So that was my high. Today, what hap today what's happening is at, at 20 years today, I would say that was I have that money, that money which I used to earn then, almost 95% I used to udaw it, mm. spend it. Right. I said, yeah, any of these small cafes, now the cafes are many more. We had one or two of them just outside college. Just go there, enjoy, and that's about it. Hmm. But now, my 20 year self today will tell me that, dude, I need to invest at least 15, 20% of it. And then, jo bachega, usko karcha karo. Hmm. so that math or the formula has changed for me today, which was hmm. not there 25 years back. But some people also have this question 
that if they're only able to let's say earn 30,000 a month let's say an example yeah and um, they are like you know i'm anyway only able to save like 2 or 3000 rupees right so it doesn't really make sense to invest this 2 to 3000 rupees of today course. that is the question that people no, have no i'm mind. telling so, you that's the misnomer <coughs> so the math today is income minus your savings or your investment is equal to expenditure hmm. for me that time 25 years back for me it was income minus everything expended equal to nothing Hmm. So I'm saying that mindset has to change and people think in that second mindset that they first invest they do income minus expenditure which it which becomes nothing. Absolutely. Right. So I'm saying it's all about effort for my maid hmm. I mandatorily uh, asked her to get 500 bucks 500 not even 2000 and this is up now for 20 years back. 500 bucks out of her income total pot income wherever she used to work at multiple households and I told her invest that Hmm. And today her daughter <coughs> is an engineer and is earning well. She's working in only in two houses. Okay. One is Wonderful. me, and she cooks at another place because her daughter has told her now you don't need to earn. Hmm. But she said no, I want to earn, and she's relatively young, so she wants to earn. Right. So I think the mindset has to change. The formula has to change, and the hmm. formula has to change not on paper. It has to change in your mind, and you have to walk the talk. Very mm. important. So that's very interesting because very few people um, can think like this, at least at least from a very young age, uh, and. usually it is because of uh, something that happened in their uh, childhood for example in my case what used to happen is uh, my parents used to give me pocket money every now and then yeah. since i was like 8 or 9 years old then i used to love going to my dad's restaurant and sitting in the cashier counter and collecting money so that sort of put a seed in my head that okay i i like to look at money being accumulated and i think that sort of translated into my teenage self okay i need to invest money because i loved looking at money you know kept in piles yeah um so i think that was the kicker for me uh but did anything happen in your childhood which um, which made you which makes you say that uh, okay because of these things which happened in my childhood i am now able to uh, be way more serious uh, than the regular an, an average person and i'm able to kind of um, take initiatives um, rather than you know sitting and waiting for things to come to me did anything happen in your childhood so many things happen but i think one as you were you you know you were narrating your incidents uh, what what i realized was uh, my mom used to tell this to me you know to the, my younger self uh, i think now she doesn't need to tell me anymore uh, that uh, don't spend beyond your means hmm. so uh, whatever you have they that's they say amdani athani kharcha rupaya so don't okay. earn a 50 paisa and don't spend a rupee Hmm. that is going to be a sure shot recipe of disaster because that's when you start getting into borrowing and debt and all of that hmm. and that's not good whether it's your individual self or is at the corporate level and um, that triggered a thought and she used to keep telling me this consistently and that triggered a thought and we were a family of four so i have my mom my dad my older sister and myself so we are four of us and there was only one earning member hmm. and until i was 18 um my mom is a homemaker and she was even then and she was very clear that and and whatever my father earned mil baat ke khane ka funda tha so all four of us had to share and eat that's how it was okay luckily those days he earned enough but the point i'm trying to say is i told myself at that point in time i have to see how much of this amdani which is my income that athani or that that pie of 100 rupees it's up to me how i shape up myself as my career to be able to make meaningful sense out of that 100 hmm. so that you arrive or you seek to arrive at that top 1 percentile of the population in hmm. terms of the earning right i think that's so important see as human beings and you know maslow's hierarchy theory is very complicated i'm not getting into that but we all have needs right yeah, and needs expands to what you have absolutely yeah. the water takes the shape of the container right. so the more you the more you eat the more your stomach will expand right. so you have to be very measured yeah. so i realize that whether that happens or no and that's something you know you can't control but you have to put in your entire 100% or close to mm. 100% to get to where they want so mm. i think that's a very important trigger and for me two things were non negotiable that live off someone else's income mm. non negotiable because right. i had this innate desire and this was again instigated by my mom uh, that uh, i need to be financially independent mm. and for that you have to earn 
and when you earn as i said then what i did started she tell you to how did change the get you to be financially independent no, because every time at the month end i kept seeing my dad giving my mom her mm. monthly uh, right. you know pocket <laughs> money as you call it and say this is for the month for running the house i said dude this is like just <laughs> as i said i can't expect anybody forget my father my mother my spouse or or my son or whenever you know that was as i said 25 years back so i couldn't think of whether I, it would be marriage or whatever but i couldn't think of getting a packet from someone else hmm. and saying that itna tumhara hai you have to spend this right. i said no chance that's not <laughs> happening for me and right. so i have to write the terms the way i believe and therefore i said this is it i said i have to chart my own course uh, my um, a uh, father was uh, into manufacturing so he was part of the manufacturing sector uh, our family barely knew the spelling of finance my my father mm. was into uh, you know the agency distribution for insurance so he understood finance so they inculcated those basic values but as i said it's a game of relay mm. so they give you a baton which is half big after that how fast you run mm. is very important makes sense so you talked about financial independence so are you financially independent now Of course. And how do you define uh, financial independence? So two parts to it. One is financial independence is being aware of your entire needs and the entire journey of financial planning. So you know, I am um, in. Uh, say, I'll give you Bombay example. I know most uh, some of the viewers are not from Mumbai, but if I give you Mumbai example, I am in Bandra Kurla complex, and I want to get to Gateway of India, which hmm. is downtown. Or, yeah, it's quite far. Yeah. So I know I have means to get to it. How do I get to it? I drive down, right. which is by my vehicle. I take a train. which is you know a little bit more tardy uh, i take a bus there is a public route available right. so there are these different means i can't fly i don't have a charter flight right. yet but there are these three <laughs> means that you actually get to it so understanding that entire financial journey and working towards it and finally being empowered to do it the way you want i think that's financial independence to me mm. in a very very layman terms mm. i'm not getting into jargons right but can you uh, can you define it in terms of uh, numbers like like most people think okay financial independence is it like having one crore or two crores like how do you put it in numbers so there is no one size fits yeah. all i think uh, kon banega karodpati has uh, made one crore like a very big number to absolutely right. but that <coughs> one uh, crore you have to understand in which part of the continent you are going to use that one crore uh, is assume, it uh, a metro uh, right city in now, india right yeah. now it's india and suppose we are in india and inflation Hmm. which is that monster which is actually there or the villain as i call it yeah. uh, in bollywood terms which is there in our real lives and not just in real life is eating on every 100 rupees that you are earning hmm. so i am 100 rupees today and assuming i do nothing to it at the end of the year this inf- this number is worth 94 rupees because 6 rupees is the inflation impact it's actually hmm. eroded my income right. so i am actually uh, my yardstick should be in your parlance to answer your question on financial independence if i have to retire at the end of 30 years from today hmm. and i want to co- continue this current lifestyle and grow it maybe by 5 10% every year how much is that kitty or that money or that booty that i require mm. to ensure that the next 20 or 25 years that i survive i don't need to do anything hmm. that should be your financial independence so your corpus or the amount that you are investing today assuming some rate that it has to grow right hmm. so the ballpark number is is inflation is at 6% yeah. but that inflation number should be increased for people living in metro cities right because our inflation is quite higher compared to yeah India. it is it is right. so that number can be 10 12 15 16% yeah. it could right. be anything so right. as i said since you can't chase that number you take one constant number and assume that your investments wherever you're putting in your money should be at least earning you double that of inflation mm. so assuming it's 6% i earn at least 12% how yeah. do you earn of course there's a different way you yeah. know there's no shortcuts to success but that's the way you have to build your kitty mm. so for you it could be 1 cr for me it could be 50 lakhs for some from another for another person it could be 5 cr mm. the number varies depending right. on how much you expend on your lifestyle mm. vis-a-vis you party every day mm. i party every hour Right. So obviously, what I need will be right. much more than what you need. Of course. So that marriage is very important before mm. you come to your final conclusion. Makes sense. So you talked about um, at least getting double the inflation returns. Uh, so how do you go about doing that? How do you, what is your um, investment strategy, so as to say, and does it keep evolving as you see the economic conditions changing? 
uh, yes it has to evolve but uh, are you completely uh, can you be completely oblivious to what is happening around you the answer is no but do you get excessively carried away okay yahan pe bum phuta so now i have to exit all my investments hmm. oh you know there is a war now you know there is a problem with russia and ukraine i need to exit everything and go back to my bank tijori that's not working right because uh, but that happens to some extent among indians yeah because it's always greed and fear no right. we, i i always tell this to all my investors that we are the biggest impediments of our own wealth creation hmm. journey in Then fact you, a recent friend a friend of mine yesterday itself he told me that uh, Sharon, you know what? Um, a recession is coming six months from now. Uh, I am removing all my money from equity. You should also do it. God so, save him or her. Uh, okay. I'm telling you seriously, <laughs> because if you all knew that, as I said, you are so wise. Then you, as I said, you know you can never ever try to time this market. Hmm. Let me give you a cricket analogy, okay? Uh, at least for me, at, you know those days when I used to watch cricket. Now the gods are changing, but for me the god of cricket was Sachin Tendulkar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Now, in his entire batting career, okay, he uh, would have faced uh, almost thirty-two thousand plus balls. Mm. Can you guess how mm. many balls he actually took a strike? It could be ones, twos, four, sixes. Doesn't matter. Mm. Can you take a wild guess? You mean like a percentage or number? Percentage. Of, yeah. I, I would say like five uh, percent. Fifty percent. Okay. You forgot zero. Okay. Zero has okay. value here. Okay. okay so fifty percent. So his strike rate for going for those ones and twos were like six. Fifty percent. Okay, you include ones and twos also. I just thought of fours and sixes. No, 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 no. Yeah, fours and sixes <laughs> are much lower. Yeah. Okay. So his strike rate was fifty percent, which means the balance fifty percent. He didn't do anything. Mm. But being at the crease was so important. Not getting out was so important. Yeah. So we cannot time the market. So I would say that longevity. and keeping your money for the long haul is very important mm. come day come mm. night come winter come storm you don't care mm. so course correction is very important so what i do for my portfolio i'm a very very old fashioned boring investor mm. i do fill it shut it and forget it okay bulk of my money is in equities in okay. the stock market can you markets. tell us like the percentage terms like uh, in my portfolio yes. 90% 90% equity yeah out okay. of 100 rupees that i invest 90% is into equities okay and uh, the 10% is you know in a combination of real estate and um, a little bit of fixed income i'll tell you the reason why because i am earning my monthly salary so mm. i get a monthly paycheck or you know a, a credit in my bank account so in my earning years i have that certain uh, percentage year mark for investments mm. i don't want to touch it because mm. that's going to be my booty which will come to me when i might not be physically or mentally mm. able to work the way i am doing today right but for you it might be entire 100% you will say no i am absolutely okay i don't even want that 10% it's fine my dad will say you know i don't want so much of equity exposure because mm. i already have a kitty now now your kitty is something which is more important mm. so he might be just 10% in equity mm. so that number and math will vary for everyone mm. so i think Got it's it. important to have a coach mm. or a guide to right. be able to tell you by looking mm. at your profile how much you need so there is no mm. one size fits all right so uh, that's another question because uh, most people i feel are not a good judge about themselves when it comes to evaluating their own risk most people don't know for example yeah. if you ask my mother she will probably say she wants to put 100% in a fixed deposit but is that the right allocation for her no so um, what uh, we as uh, you know millennials or you know people who are in their early 30s which is the bulk of my audience uh, what can we do to kind of uh, educate our parents about how to invest It's very very difficult to do that to right. be very honest it's easier to plan your own investments I'll yeah. tell you why because you took the example of fixed deposits it took me 15 years to convince my mom why on Akshay Tritya she should not buy physical gold okay but she should buy gold ETF ha huh. you know so it's it it takes uh, you know faith can move mountains 15 years now she is convinced yeah yeah now no. she is convinced okay. so i started the process when we launched uh, our gold fund uh, back in 2007 and okay. uh, almost at the 10th 11th year she was convinced hmm. but the point i'm trying to say is that instead of convincing them it's very difficult to tell them because they're still reasonably old school of thought hmm. okay some of them i would say are the savvier lot who understand um, Uh, you know the concept of thali it could be a south indian thali north indian whatever you like or a gujju thali i love gujju thali uh, it's got the right amount of carbs so it's got the rotis it's got the rice it's got the dal so your proteins it's got the gulab jamun so the fats and the sugar everything is there 
so that should be your concept of what kind of assets you should have in your portfolio mm. i would say to the millennials you can afford more of carbs because you yeah. do a lot of workout so why not go yeah. for high end rice mm. you can tweak you can say i'll have low gi rice you can have yeah. red rice that's your prerogative but go for it mm. for me i'll say okay you know i don't want so much of carbs i'll go for more of proteins and i'm a vegetarian unfortunately so i mm. can't even do with fish and chicken so for me it's more of paneer Right. more of dal unfortunately but i'm saying that even that gives you some amount of carbs hmm. so i think that mix is what you need to ascertain hmm. so i said instead of educating somebody else i would say charity begins with self hmm. so start orienting your own portfolio towards as i said i started off with the caffeine booster so i call equities the red bull of your portfolio for a hmm. teetotaler again a okay. veggie teetotaler talking about okay. partying so that's how <laughs> okay. i am So there, I'm talking about giving you that Red Bull in your portfolio. Hmm. It will give you that nasha. It will keep you awake if you want to study till three in the morning. Hmm. With nimbu pani, you can't do. With green tea, which I drink, you can certainly not do. Hmm. So I think these are you know important journeys which you have to plan. And again, I would repeat, you know, and I, it might sound cliche that you need a coach. Hmm. For so me, how do you Sachin, get a coach? Yeah. yeah. So as I said, Sachin, or you know, today it's uh, P V Sindhu or Sanya, whoever they are, they all need a coach. They might be fantastic in their profession in what they are doing, but that coach has to tell them what they are doing and show them the mirror. So the way you have a general physician for your health, you require a financial planner for your financial health. It's mm. very simple. Right. So look out, go talk to people. You have many, uh, you know, dime a mm. dozen financial planners, mm. so advisors. There is one problem here, right? Huh. Because there's only thousand three hundred certified financial, uh, SEBI registered investment advisors in India. Okay. So what are the other kinds of professions, uh, professional uh, people uh, that uh, people should reach out to when it comes to managing their money? Because for most people today, it's either their dad or an uncle. Right, right. Or, an, or an LIC insurance agent. <laughs> that agent. is true. Right? That is true. What are the things that they should actually be looking at? No, I would say uh, you know today is the generation where you have uh, quite a bit of this available online on social mm. media. Right. I think go for the there are these DIY kits. You know, for example, I am very bad DIY person. If you ask me to make my own pizza, I'll muff it up. Yeah. You ask me to eat it, I will do it very beautifully. So. For some of you who have similar kind of feelings, you have to, you know, go through all of these. Uh, social media has got these DIY kits. Hmm. You can, you have these master classes. Please enroll for them. Go yeah. for them. Uh, you have a lot of these blogs which speak about it. You have distributors and advisors, all of them in the country, and you have right. certified financial planners. So I think you have the entire platter available for you. So every variety. Sorry, there's a mango season, so bear with me. Hmm. You don't need to just satiate your palate with just Alfonso mangoes. You hmm. have pairi, you have badami, you have dasari, and you have all of it, and they taste so good. Hmm. So your objective of having mangoes will be achieved. Right, makes sense. So you you told us that you invest ninety percent of your money in equity. I'm sure a lot of people would want to know because within equity there's a lot of things that keep happening, right? Equity means the stock market, yeah. right? So within equity, how do you kind of further divide your money? Can you like uh, in terms of uh, the nuances? The nuances. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for me, how it's worked usually is, and again, uh, I'll try to de. Uh, Technicalize it as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, so there are these very large companies which are called large cap companies, yeah. where I believe that over the next five, ten, fifteen years. Uh, When you mean large cap, these are like the top hundred companies. Yeah, the top hundred companies by virtue of size. Yeah. By virtue, uh, we call it the these market cap. These are like capital. your Reliance and ITC. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, they will have limited elbow room to give you return per return, return per return. You know, yeah. kind of a thing. Uh, so I, my focus, my portfolio is more around the mid cap or the mid market companies, mm. which could. Would be the future large caps, right? Like you know, an Ayushman Khurana getting to be a big B, like Amitabh Bachchan, something mm. like that. Okay. So we know Amitabh Bachchan has got. You think his, he'll become like that? No, Actually. I don't think, <laughs> but I like him also as much as I like big B. So I'm just <laughs> giving you an analogy. See, you know, when Vicky Donor came, nobody knew about Ayushman yes. Khurana, so yes. it required education. Now everybody know. Mm. So a mid cap is like that. When it is mm. under researched and under owned, nobody knows about it. Mm. But that's where you have a potential to become a superstar. So I think my portfolio is fulcrum more around those Aishman Khuranas who have the potentials to become big bees. Hmm. So that's for me. What is the percent? Like out of the ninety percent, how 60 much? Sixty percent of that, almost okay. roughly about sixty percent. Because as I said, for me, it's not that I don't like large cap companies, but I am okay to take that risk at my hmm. age and stage in life okay. to be able to be 
gaining possibly mm. that extra i might not really make it in the next one two years but who cares i want this money for the next 10 15 years mm. when i may not work or i might just decide to go to rishikesh i might do whatever right, right. so for that <laughs> i want my you know my do handy so mm. that's how i plan it and and within mid cap now let's say you put 60% of your money in mid cap now how do you select within that because now we have multiple options you either invest directly in the stocks or you can invest in uh, mutual funds or you can invest in etfs so how do you do that next so my large cap funds are all in etfs okay. i do predominantly etfs because that's very low cost for me yeah. uh i have only one stock in my dmat account and that also i got it in dowry okay. and that is kotak okay. bank because i have been working with the kotak group so i get a lot of esops so those esops uh, uh, that's the only stock that i have in my dmat account okay. but my entire mutual fund investments whatever i have done so far is everything through a systematic investment plan hmm. so i get a monthly income and i have allocated x amount and i say that that will go into a monthly uh, a systematic investment plan and that's my discipline hmm. so then i don't care whether there are hail storms in landor or there is snowfall in gulmarg it doesn't matter to me okay my investments will go absolutely uninterrupted hmm. that's how i plan so an sip into mid cap mutual funds mid caps yeah so i do both i do mid caps and flexi cap flexi cap actually hmm. has the flexibility uh, to do both large caps as well as mid caps right and also some small cap also they might uh, have a very tail end yeah that's right right, right. got it and you also mentioned about uh, passing the baton right about uh, the knowledge that you have about uh, financial planning and you pass it on to your kids but you mentioned that you don't want to give your money to your uh, kids uh, because and, and compare that with my parents my parents have don't really spend their money right they have saved money but they're always thinking about the worst case scenario always like right? and they're always thinking about it from the perspective of their kids which is me right so up until 3 4 years back their entire uh, objective was to save that money uh, for my education and my future and all of that uh, so they only been thinking about me and um, but now that i have uh, you know done all of this i told them you know what uh, i don't need that money anymore i have always been telling them i want you to actually go out there and spend it and go on for international vacations and uh, but it's very difficult for them to do it it's a sudden mindset shift uh, but you are not like that you are like you know my kids have to earn their own bread and butter Uh, can you talk uh, talk a little bit about that why do you think that is so important see because uh, i was not even born with a copper spoon or a brass spoon my son is born with a golden spoon okay okay so uh, when you already inherit a golden platter then you don't even know what the other form of metals are is very plain and simple hmm. uh, again as I, i i don't want to say this but bulk of this generation is that so called uh, entitled generation so they think everything comes to them on a platter Hmm. and as i said uh, i had to fight for the platter pehle plate ke liye ladai karo aur uske baad uske khane ke liye so when you know when you've gone through the chiseling yourself i tell my son do don't focus on chiseling just your body you have to chisel your finances it's so okay. important hmm. and if you tell him or her whoever it is in case in this case my son if you tell him that it's already available for you what is the incentive hmm. to go walk that extra mile when you know that everything is a slam dunk for you everything is available hmm. See, finally, it might go to him. Right. I know that, but I'm saying at least uh-huh. right now I don't want him to get that mentality of complacency. Yeah. You want to tell him that nothing is yours, but eventually you might give it to him if he watches the scene. Who knows? Now. Yeah. But if I don't <laughs> adopt another child, then maybe. Yeah. But <laughs> as of now, he has to fight for his platter. As I right. said, if you haven't seen anything, if mm. you are, you know, born in an AC, you know, drive in an AC, and then come into the house, so you don't even know what summer is. You don't know what winter is. Yeah. So I think learning the various shades of winter and braving it out there uh, is very important. So I take him to orphanages as much I as much I, as I take him to border wherever it's permitted hmm. to show him that these are the extremes of life. Hmm. Somebody is doing it for you. Somebody is somebody else is doing it on behalf of them hmm. because they don't have the kind of luxuries that you have. Right. So I think it's important that every Gen Z and every millennial today understands. that it's very important to earn hmm. your own safety net hmm. safety net was never given to us we earned right. it so it's right. very important interesting so um you mentioned that you were not born with a silver spoon or a golden spoon but of course now that th- uh, by virtue of you being excelling at your professional career a lot of things has changed for you financially so uh, can you walk us a little bit about how lifestyle changes has it changed for you significantly and how do you constantly uh, control yourself from not you know spending you know money that you are earning because most people face that problem 
um, not at the later stage, but in the beginning stages itself, which is the bigger problem. That as soon as they, let's say, get a 30% hike, 40% hike, they are proportionately increasing their expenses. Yeah. How did you manage that and how did your lifestyle actually change? Uh, so for starters, uh, you know, I have certain very strong likes. Uh, so I love uh, exploring new destinations and all of that. Uh, but uh, there are also... How many countries have you been to? Uh, not too many, about 23, 24. So okay. I have a long list to uh, go. Uh, okay. how, uh, how many more countries left? Uh, at least 30, 40 more. Uh, if 30, not, 40. Yeah, okay. yeah. I Wonderful. Think, yeah, okay. I, I, try, I try to do as much as I can. But the point is, and sometimes COVID also puts a spanner. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, I am also extremely value conscious. And I think that comes in from my middle class upbringing that uh, everything looks good at a price. Like in, when I do my investment, for me, it's growth at a reasonable price. The GAAP mm. principle. Yeah. So the value for money or the VFM status for me is very, very important. I wouldn't have any qualms eating vada pav in a Zunka Bakar stall. But if you ask me to pay the same thing for an American vada pav, which is the burger, I feel bad. Hmm. I like it. I will eat it finally. So I'm saying that value consciousness is very, very high. So therefore, I don't end up splurging. So I think hmm. that math, as I said, you know, the whatever you earn, minus your savings is equal to your or that savings going into investments is equal to your expenditure. If you inscribe that math into you, then you don't get carried away by all mm. these temptations. So that's very, very important. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as far as lifestyle, as I said, I come from a very, very humble middle class background. So uh, I don't get carried away by any of these things. It's just mm. so natural. So right. uh, uh, I don't fancy, you know, big cars or those Bugattis or I don't, mm. I, I don't even know how to pronounce half of these things that my son keeps correcting me, but it doesn't matter to me. Does he uh, ask for a car? No, no, no. It he is mm. even worse than me. So he's <laughs> saying, Mom, why do we really need to spend? Uh, so luckily, I've <laughs> nice. tried to instill some bit of those values into him. Uh, he had his birthday just a couple of days back. And I actually offered to him that, why don't you, you know, call a few friends and we'll host it. Uh, say, no, 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 let's not spend. I will watch IPL match in a small <laughs> mini theater. So I think th nice. thankfully those values are still there. Nice. So my needs are only, uh, you know, the immediate needs are only receding. So I used mm. to eat three rotis, now I eat one roti. Okay. Okay. That, that also has now gone gluten free. So I'm saying right. all of those needs are only dissipating. Hmm. First, two katori chawal, now one katori. So you know, hmm. uh, the price of rice is increasing, but my demand is also reducing. Right. So it's never that um, indulgence quotient. So hmm. I think the more you are aware that you know, uh, all of these things are finite and you know, you can go endlessly into splurging. So very theoretically, people ask me, you have the money, why can't mm. you? I said, let me put that money to use, let it multiply. Mm. So in the not so good times, it is like actually like the ant and the grasshopper story. Yeah. I don't want to be like the grasshopper. You can be multiple times the ant and why not? Hmm. Some people say it's just going too much, but I always believe that having your safety net and you know, we've gone through one of the most uh, uh, drastic phase in our lives called the COVID. Right. Life has changed 360 degrees after that. Hmm. So you know that nothing is constant. So I think some of those things, I'm never tempted to do any of these things. Hmm. I'm as okay, you know, somebody uh, drives me down in Mercedes from uh, my house to, uh, uh, you know, the workplace and as comfortable taking an auto ride back from office to home. So yes. I have zero, zero strings attached. Absolutely fine. So, and I also think it's about identifying what are those one or two areas of life there where you want to splurge on. For example, you mentioned traveling, right? So for me, it would again be traveling itself. Um, when it comes to a car, I would not want to splurge a lot on a car. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to a house, I might just want to spend a lot of money on the furnishing, but maybe not in buying a big house right away. Absolutely. Right? And when it comes to, you know, uh, designer outfits, I would not want to buy designer outfits, Absolutely. you know, like 30, 40,000 rupees. But in, and then there's some people who say, you know what, um, uh, don't go to Starbucks coffee, you will save a lot of money. But I feel like if you really like it so much and yeah. if it's actually improving your productivity at work, then it's fine to go there and spend that money. But Absolutely. figure out other areas of your life where you're going to spend totally. lesser. Right? See, and I that's the balance. Keeping the you balance. don't need everything. You're right. Keeping yeah. the balance is super important. Yeah, right. and I can, as I said, I can uh, uh, party with a pauper as much as I can party with a king in right. the same zest. So I don't think that's a problem. Hmm. So uh, recently we saw that, uh, and since you worked in the debt industry as well, uh, the debt funds have lost their taxation uh, benefit, mm -hmm. right? And that has been a significant uh, blow according to me when mm -hmm. you compare it with the uh, FD. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that happened? 
and uh, what do you think what, what will what will be the next steps for somebody when they want to invest in safe asset classes mm -hmm. uh, such as you know debt so you know i want to go to alibag okay? okay how do i do i have a roro now that's an option i can go by train again i can go by bus and i can drive around these are the four options that is i can think of right now where is now. alibag alibag is uh, a coastal uh, place about uh, like an hour uh, by roro and about two and a half three hours drive from mumbai from mumbai okay very okay. nice place okay yeah. and uh -huh. since you're from mangalore you must visit alibag for sure nice. now uh, mutual funds uh, were behaving in some sense like a roro because they had that 20% added tax advantage what Now is the roro uh, roro is uh, that massive ship which takes you uh, you know in a very short span of time uh, to your destination okay. like the one that's there in greece the similar uh, okay. it's, it's a massive uh, so this is the lesson. one over here which takes you to alibag it's at mazgaon dock yeah okay. from there you can actually take that roro and reach in uh, 45 minutes you can reach uh, alibag okay. okay so for the same set of return what was a mutual fund doing it had this benefit of taxation which is not available Can no. you explain what is that benefit of taxation it was getting earlier? Yeah, so the benefit is a benefit called indexation, which means that if I own something at hundred, and at the end of say three years I made hundred and twenty rupees, so effectively you will say that your gains on which you have to pay capital gains tax is twenty rupees, right. which is correct. But in mutual fund, this is true for bank fixed deposits, and now true for mutual funds. earlier what used to happen is that this 100 was not 100 because there was this concept of inflation indexation so 100 became 105 at the end of year 1 110 year 2 and 115 year 3 notionally right yeah notionally of huh. course so therefore the tax that you paid was on 5 rupees because the indexed value of your investment was 115 hmm. so you paid tax on 5 rupees not on the entire 20 rupees hmm. so even though you got 20 rupee profit you are paying tax on the 5 rupees perfect right. and that's called indexation very big benefit right you're right. saving on tax right so now uh, the ministry of finance says that that uh, indexation benefit is not available for debt mutual funds hmm. which means but why did they do that okay why did they do that because they wanted to get everything at parity i mean hmm. my conjecture i didn't speak with the finance minister but okay. that's conjecture but have you spoken to the finance minister no i don't intend to also okay. i i'm assuming she's doing a good job and i i kind of uh, you know she she's doing a very very onerous job right now but uh, i said yeah i mean that's something which uh, probably has come a little bit premature has come but even hmm. premature baby survive right, right. seen that so yeah this baby will survive there's no two ways about it hmm. uh, you have to acclimatize your mind if you go to leh ladakh okay for those who've been there you can't go and behave like a maverick on day one you have to acclimatize because oxygen levels come down hmm. so your tax levels have gone up so you have hmm. to acclimatize it takes a little bit of time but don't do anything cute hmm. don't do anything smart just just live the course and make sure that your destination your process has probably could see some tweaks hmm. but finally you have to reach your destination right so i would say that mutual funds have become less attractive it doesn't mean that you will disown mutual funds hmm. because if that were to be the case then people will always drive by car to go to say lonavla which is a hill station in mumbai uh, uh, you know 150 kilometers from mumbai they'll always they will never look at other means of transport hmm. but if everything is coexisting Okay that tells you that it's all about getting used to something. Hmm. So yes it's early days it's a big shocker to the mutual fund industry but life must go on. Right. So I think that's that's so the way I, I, I look at the, it. The the doubt that people have is uh, both a debt fund and a fixed deposit is giving similar returns right now. Right. Right. Now fixed deposit is fixed. Right. right but debt mutual fund can still fluctuate it's Absolute. not like guaranteed absolutely and now if you're telling me that they're going to be taxed the same way why should i take the extra risk in a debt mutual fund yeah you are absolutely correct and in some sense uh, therefore a little bit of cannibalization uh, by the banking industry to the mutual fund industry is inevitable wo to hoke rahega but the point is that you are also compromising on liquidity hmm I pay extra in a roro, but the point is, I reach in forty-five minutes. Visa be driving for three and a half hours and nagging, you know, at your yeah. spouse or at your girlfriend or your right. spice or whoever he or she is. But the point is, at least I have the comfort. So this is uncertainty of the roads and still reaching my destination versus a certainty. Hmm. I know the trade-off is very difficult, but my point is that you have the liquidity. 
Hmm, right. I put in money today before 2 p.m. and I redeem before 3 p.m. Lo and behold, I have hmm. money in my bank account at 9 p.m. It's the cost of it's that absolutely. You 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 should be ready to take that risk because there's liquidity. Yeah, and liquidity comes at a correct, cost. and that comes at a cost. And right. also, you need to keep in mind. And uh, again, I'm trying to de-jargonize that today, the entire banking system in India has got less money. Hmm. or less liquidity as we call it therefore banks are not in a position to say my way or highway hmm. so they want it their way and they also want it your way so they will come to you like you know atithi devo bhava and tell you that oh i want more money right this will not remain forever hmm. alcohol has to get over the dopamine has to end so when hmm. that gets over then you are you know in a surplus liquidity regime hmm. these rates will not last Right. So yes, it's a great idea for you to lock in some amount of certainty, but it's okay if you lock in some amount into uncertain. It's absolutely fine, but knowing your risk profile, understanding mm. how much of um, uh, kick your body can fathom. Mm. In this case, how much of kick your financial portfolio can fathom is up to you and completely your prerogative. So yes, you will weigh pros and cons. Some money will flow, no doubt about it, but it's not end of the road. Hmm. Understood. All right. So now let's do something different. Let's say that um, we are having a mock interview, right? And I were to ask you, what is the number one thing, or it may, there could be multiple things. Let's say number one thing that you felt uh, that you were made the CEO of uh, Cortec Investment Advisory. And I'm sure there were a lot of other um, contenders as well, right? That's how it is. So what do you think that you did uh, over the course of your career that led you to become the CEO and not others? Uh, wow. Nobody's asked me this question, yeah. but chalo, let me attempt. Uh, two most important things I think is very important to get you to where you are. Uh, one is empathy. I think mm. that's top of the mind. So every time you cannot say, how do I perceive it? It's always about how the other person may perceive it. Mm. I think very, very important. Uh, we often confuse empathy and sympathy. They don't, your team, the people who work with you do not require your sympathy. What they require is to look at it from their perspective, mm. which means when you write six, I actually come and tell you it's a six and then sit across and then tell you how it can be made nine. So mm. I think very, very important. And we both are on the opposite sides right now. So I think empathy is one and have a lot of fun. Okay. I mean, I, I truly believe in one thing. It doesn't matter at what age, what stage, what profile you are. You have to be easily accessible. So I am literally available for my entire team. Uh, I sleep for about six to seven hours in a 24 hour schedule. Uh, but apart from that, I'm always available for my team and they have no protocols to follow. Hmm. There is no, uh, I mean, though I have people to assist me with calendar and all, I have no protocols. You want to reach me on LinkedIn, you want to reach me on Insta, you want to reach me on Twitter or you want to reach me on WhatsApp. It's hmm. all available for you. Okay. So I think these are two, uh, you know, the softer aspects, which uh, in the process of your leadership journey, they somewhere subconsciously get compromised. Hmm. So I have zero halo around me. As I said, um, when we're getting late for a meeting, my, my team, if he doesn't have a car and driver, I don't have a car and driver myself. Today okay. I had to rent one okay. uh, because I don't believe in owning these kind of assets, which only depreciate, you know, from the garage. So uh, I don't insist that my colleague has to order, for, you know, call for an Uber. He says, auto hai toh, auto mein chale jate. Hmm. they feel, yaar, inko auto mein kaise leke but I said, I don't have such feelings. Right. So, you know, it's about feeling one with the team because it's the team that is responsible for your success or failure. Right. I can't do it all. All. Only Rajni. Rajni can't? Huh, okay. I can't. So <laughs> Rajni can. I can't. Right. So I think therefore, I think these are the two most important qualities which I think probably, uh, uh, you know, because I got considered, uh, probably set me apart. Nice. Nice. So how many people were there in the contention? I don't know. You don't know. It's, it's, not, it's not even an open secret. And, so. and who is the one who actually takes this uh, decision? Uh, in terms of uh, getting you to leadership roles, so yes. there is a council. So there okay. is a group management council uh, which has a team of, uh, you know, uh, people from various, uh, you know, departments across the group. Hmm. Uh, so they are, they keep, uh, you know, brainstorming, discussing. We really don't know what happens. Right. We may know what happens in Shark Tank, but we don't know <laughs> what happens here in uh, the Kotak Tank. But yeah, that's, that's how they decide. So, and I'm also um, very sure that uh, over the um, course of your day-to-day uh, -day life, 
you meet a lot of brilliant people lot of successful people also a lot of self made super rich ultra high net worth individuals um if you were to tell me uh, what are the traits that they have which sets them apart what would they be you know vidya balan she said in the movie dirty picture have you seen this movie i have not seen i've heard of the movie okay you heard of the movie but look at look at the tag i was too young uh, that time to tell my mother can i go see dirty picture no but now you don't need a permission <laughs> so you must watch but doesn't matter but look it up she says what sells in a movie huh. is entertainment 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 and i believe what makes you good to great Hmm. is humility 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 i think it's so important hmm. the most underrated quality i would say that uh, humility is what sets you apart and uh, you know the the more uh, or the higher frequency with which you keep yourself grounded irrespective of where you are irrespective of how much of money is there in your hmm. bank balance can you give an example of uh, someone that you met who is really really successful and what kind of a trait which one example of uh, how they express humility no so uh, uh, our own vice chairman mr uday kotak for example huh. is is the classic epitome of humility uh, uh, you know not today you know in 10 years back or 12 years back also it requires great humility to pick up the phone and talk to you and discuss markets hmm. uh, and give you that you know sense of importance he knows it all i you know i think this is one of the you know successful uh, uh, banker story that the world has seen not just india has seen but for that banker to pick up the call and talk to you what does it tell you it's just about humility right, right. and always wanting to learn irrespective of what level you are uh, I tell people uh, my biggest lessons I learn in a classroom with a bunch of students hmm. who could be half my age but they can teach me double the number of things so uh, it's it's all about humility. Hmm anything else that's it that's what it Yeah is. that's that's very important um, uh, second is obviously uh, you know uh, understanding uh, how much high is your conviction and to ensure that that conviction doesn't become full hardiness. Hmm. So there's a very very thin line of Uh, differentiation and what happens is that when success gets to your head uh, it's quite natural that you believe its conviction but willingly it has actually morphed itself into foolhardiness hmm. and that means can you tell what is foolhardiness foolhardiness means that i am never wrong i am right but the huh. circumstances around me are a problem for i'll give you an example uh, suppose i like banking sector let me give you an example um, and in that suppose i like public sector banks as a case in point um, you know for those who understand or those who don't doesn't matter and assuming that segment has not done well for like 10 years i'm giving you extreme examples just to uh, put it into you and uh, i took a call as a money manager that i am going to buy these bonds or buy these stocks and they are going to be the best uh, performing class over the next 3 years it's not worked Three years. Hmm. The fourth year it doesn't work. The fifth year it doesn't work, and you are convinced. You keep telling yourself, not realizing that it's time to cut your losses. It's not worked out. That means there is something which is beyond that you are not able to appreciate. We are in the game of long-term investments, but it's also important to bet on the right kind of sectors. You know, when you go for a derby racing, you want to bet on a winner. Derby is the you, horse, race. horse racing. Horse racing. Yeah. Yes. Will you consistently bet on a losing horse, assuming you understand and track patterns? So, will you consistently bet on a losing horse? The answer is no. Hmm. And that is when I say your conviction has actually formed or transformed itself into foolhardiness. That you are led to believe that whatever you are doing is only going to be right. Mm. So I think that is very very important as Be an investor. You want to invest uh, um experimenting with other things. No, I would say your mind has to be agile. Mm. When the mind is rigid, when the mind is closed, it often ends up that your conviction what you think may not be the real thing so i think leaders have to understand and that's what as i said differentiates you from good to great people are good in general i i seldom find right. not good people okay right. i don't even call it bad no but the point is um, you don't meet great people every day right so that's important hmm so uh what do you think are uh, because i believe in this concept called the unfair advantage mm-hmm. and everybody has that mm-hmm. right what do you think is your unfair advantage i don't know what is my unfair advantage uh, because uh, something that you felt like you had it mm-hmm. uh, which lot of people do not have and you capitalize on that advantage and you went forward see advantage that women have generally apart from having iq is eq 
right uh, yeah. i again i'm I've not told that i that. i am not i'm not feminist by the way let me clarify and i am not rooting for any particular gender but i must say uh, if i ask my husband to multitask trust me he muffs it up trust me okay. and i don't need uh, it's not me everyone around him says it and uh, similar is my son and uh, i have a pet also at home also who is a guy but uh, he doesn't have to do any task so he's out of the picture but uh, i have enough and more examples where you give uh, uh, women a chore or multiple chores they are able to use their um, literal uh, you know uh, the all tab hat in their mind and try to do the multitasking i like now, all tab hat in their mind okay yeah nice. that's a computer all tab yeah. which you have to keep toggling around and now uh, i don't know if it's unfair but you can play to your advantage hmm. and in the financial services sector the the female gender is in the minority right But how again, much percentage would you say are women in the finance see now it would be depending on which sector etc it would still be around uh, 15 odd percent uh, okay. this is the average mm-hmm. but uh, somewhere it's even 5% somewhere it's even 25% but when i started off 20 22 years back that number was just 1 2 3% mm hmm. right. so i was the only woman in the dealing room then and now maybe instead of one there are two three more but the point is that uh, i don't know if you call that unfair advantage but for uh, for you uh, that is an opportunity i look at it as an opportunity where uh, uh, you know if you google by the way uh, top chefs in the country the top 5 you will not find a woman right right but if you google top sports person the top 5 have women so it's clearly telling you that uh, you know the sports arena which was considered or you know the uh, kushti jo wrestling wagera ka jo arena hai which was considered to be uh, men or you know male dominated uh, and uh, people said that oh it's kitchen so it has to be a women's territory hmm. that norm is completely changing right so that clearly tells you that uh, the past notions have to be completely done as shift all del you have to completely erase it from your mind and then rewrite new rules hmm. as i said i really don't know if you call it an unfair advantage i call it a brahmastra that you have in your hand hmm. which is available only to the divine souls hmm. so you are human soul so just go right. for it makes sense so last question i want to ask you is let's say uh, if somebody comes to uh, work want to work with you uh what are the some of the things that you will be evaluating of that person before you hire that person because i am about to hire a lot of people for my own mm-hmm. company mm-hmm. and uh, i wanted to know because i r- come to realize that it's all about the team who you hire and who you work with that's the only way you can scale in a company absolutely right so how do you look at how to hire someone is it just raw intelligence or skills or is there something more i'll tell you who i don't hire Okay. Then that will give you a color on whom I hire. Right. If somebody asks me what are my job timings, cross. Doesn't matter. You might okay. be from an Ivy League institution, dude. You're not there, so that's a complete cross. I am gender agnostic, so for me, it doesn't matter who it is. Somebody has to demonstrate the passion. Hmm. I have to see that burning desire in him or her to excel. Hmm. I ask you three questions about the firm you've come to me to meet me for an interview if you don't even know the basic things about my firm cross you're gone hmm. again it doesn't matter you are a gold medalist in chartered accountancy it doesn't matter to me keep your gold in your house hmm. and gold is appreciating in value by the way so right. keep it with you i'm very bullish on gold so i think these are some of my negative list so i completely um, I am very happy to get somebody even if he or she comes in from some remote location hmm. in some part of the country but the kind of burning desire to succeed and excel and more importantly accept that with all honesty hmm. and tell me that you know what I've come to do this I don't gauge you by your english you can talk in whatever i speak about 7 to 8 languages so whatever language you like you communicate with me hmm. but communicate with honesty Right. and that's something you know in the first 10 15 minute of conversation i'm able to do that filter right. and if my i'm mentally switched off then the rest of it is a formality hmm. so i think that's very very important so you mentioned and, burning uh, desire how do you look at burn? like is it a person who has a lot of energy to talk with or how is it no it's not necessary because some bit of energy is also cacophony it's like you know making empty vessels making a lot of noise yeah. uh, but uh, as i said uh, you know if you're re- you, if you're interviewing for a particular role uh, i quiz uh, you less on your technical aspects it's assume that if you're interviewing for a particular role that comes by the book so it's assume that will be my tail end question hmm. my question is more about um, the family the upbringing hmm. what has happened do you have a sibling 
what does your mother believe what does your mother feel see for me the ecosystem that you come from tells me a lot about your culture mm. very very important Got so it. out of a 45 minute interview in first 15 minutes i get this entire uh, horoscope if you were to call it right. and uh, if i like the basic smell test so this is my smell test if it passes the basic smell test then i go into asking you about the firm why do you want to work longevity will you sign a contract with me for 5 years mm. and i always believe uh, in your professional life you need to treat your job like marriage hmm only lucky people get married twice i tell people right so your uh, when you mean um, lucky in the sense that they both married to their significant other and so also to their job no lucky Then. people get to remarry in their personal lives that's what i meant uh, okay okay so like that so okay. ideally you would want to stick to one marriage okay. that's what you would it's it's a wishful thing but if you are very lucky then you and you muff it up so badly then you get remarried and that's right. how it is but you have to treat your job like your marriage hmm if you are not married then your parents marriage or whoever marriage as an institution which is for long it is hmm. for keeps and there is never a perfect marriage hmm. because the the sand is always undulating is always uneven and it's always never a bed of roses because roses also come with thorns so keep that in mind that when you are going to get into a wedlock profession professional wedlock it's for keeps unless something happens and you keep your gray matter satiated is very very important these days i find um, uh the the you know the newer generation that i uh, you know interview are very very distracted right and when you see them you know it's constantly shaking the leg shaking the hand uh, trying to check your mobile always yeah as i said it's complete cross mark for me so that's Absolutely. 99% of them gone they're gone it's okay <laughs> i i will you're the 1% club right. i'm the 1% <laughs> club i'm very happy working with that 1% which is extremely motivated as i said even today i work for about 15 hours a day hmm wow for me uh, yesterday somebody asked me how uh, you know how many days a week you work and i answered eight okay and he thought i didn't know my math but i know my math right so uh, for me it's not a good friday for me every day is a friday i say tgif in the same breath as i say tgi uh, m which is thank god it's a monday huh. so i look forward to my monday mornings as much as i look forward to my friday evening mm. parties right. so i think that's very very important and mm. uh, and i also yeah. just to intervene i also feel like it's about uh, feeling like it's like a game right because we love playing games yeah. um because when we are going from one step to another step and we progress in that progress bar we sort of get that dopamine hit so i think when you find a career path uh which sort of feels like a game as well and you sort of feel like you're always progressing and you're solving very interesting problems which sort of releases a dopamine for you i think that's when work really becomes play do you do you kind of have that no sort of no feeling? absolutely and as i said uh, in some sense uh, i liken it to the game of poker okay. now uh, poker is a game which till the last card is you know you burn and you turn so till you turn the last card and you're holding some cards close to your chest you really do not know looking at the other people around you who could be the likely winner hmm. yes your stakes can go up you know you keep betting higher but you could be faking it too yeah so many things can be faked even uh, you know uh, poker game can be faked but the point is poker is a game of strategy it's not gambling and that's what excites me to this uh, uh, you know the game uh, to tell you that you never know till the last card is turned you could mm. have a trips which is a trio in the game of uh, you know teen patti as they call it and that's that's the supreme card and then you go all in mm. so i would say that uh, but to know what is there in the last card you have to survive that entire journey mm. and for me uh, the workplace is all about creating that journey and creating that ecosystem around you mm. So I always, for example, in my team, I say uh, I don't know where this designation exists, but I I have a CHO, hmm. a Chief Happiness Officer. I said your role is to you ensure. You have that actually, Chief Happiness Officer. Informally, informally. I mean, it's not okay. in the card, but yeah. I'm saying somebody who does his day job. I say you get that extra job of being the CHO. Right. So you know the guy or the girl is trying to uh, rejuvenate the marketplace or the marketplace around you hmm. because it's very easy to get bogged down by monotony. Hmm. I mean, every day if somebody gives you curd rice, right. every day if somebody gives you dal bati, I and mean, whatever whatever you like, yeah. or everybody somebody chicken gives you neer dosa chicken or gyros, chicken gyros, gyros. Dosa. Yes. yeah, what do you do? Yeah. You eat it once, twice, thrice, and after that you'll say, "Yeah, boss, give me some variety." Right. And then you might want to shift to mock meat. You might want to shift to something more exotic like red meat. Yeah. Depending on what you like. I mean, that's very very important for me. 
so i think uh, doing those color checks and then sustaining in the workplace i mean 23 years law uh, you know existing or being in one place people always ask me and there are two ways to look at it either your furniture or your antique piece and you right. know the value of both right yeah. written down value of a furniture is as good as zero but antique is something which is priceless mm. so i think your journey of excellence should always be that you go towards that antique piece mm. and that you will not uh, tell yourself that oh i am the antique piece the world has to tell you that yeah. right that's right. very important so you mentioned about uh, working in in your in your company for almost 22 years and uh, very few people have that sort of a track record especially in today's uh, generation everybody is about moving from uh, one profile to another profile uh, and i think that's important in the early stage of your career to know what you truly want to do and then yeah. go all in right yeah, yeah. so but are there any things that you think the youth should do to kind of figure out what they should be doing because i feel like life has placed all of us on different parts of the map mm-hmm. and we cannot see the whole map right yeah, yeah. the only way to see the whole map is actually do everything or to talk to the people who've done different of different course, things of course of um, course what do you think the youth should do today to kind of figure out what exactly they should be doing see honestly if you ask me would i have survived for so long i, I would say answer is no you know because when i quit credence uh, and i moved to kotak in 99 uh, i told credence i'm going on a 6 month sabbatical okay this is what i told them and uh, dil picture mein dialogue hai pati to pati varna rakhi ready so my okay. funda was that 6 months i'll give it a time if i don't sustain then i'm coming back to credence hmm. because when i was quitting credence there were two partners then now it's a uh, you know private limited company they told me you are the life and blood of credence hmm. so i said blood has to circulate so let me circulate i'll go and then if i become out of circulation there i'll come here that's how huh. i left there but since then there's been no looking back So I would say if so I So what did you do in that uh, six, and when was this 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 was in 99 November 99 okay. 2000 April 2000 and that's when I said that uh, uh, so that's what I'm saying so if I extend that analogy to today I would say that uh, you know find different ways of doing the same thing in your job you mm. cannot do you know you go to oberoi that chef out there at ranji pani is making the same pizzas for you know yeah. but he will try to bring in some variation he'll go and chit chat with the a uh, client say uh, some day he will come and you know serve that thing for you yeah. so the chef actually becomes your uh, you know server so you have to find out ways and means to invigorate yourself it's very very important hmm. imagine the best pub that you would have gone ever whether it's in bangalore mangalore or in mumbai if that dj monday to friday plays the same music yeah. i kid you not that pub will shut down right so even that dj has to find newer ways to attract the millennials so that mm. they love going there mm. so i think at the workplace you have to find different exciting ways to do the same thing can you give some examples of what you have done uh, in in that direction of doing different things no so i have uh, gone at every block of 3 to 4 years i have told the management that give me more responsibility i am a so very you were like the go getter you went to your boss and said give me more work yeah yeah That's give me the, more work because yeah. i feel i am underutilized and mm. very few people actually go and accept yeah. to their subordinates or to their bosses that you know i am they all believe that they are 100% utilized right. and i believe that's all faff nobody is 100% utilized yeah. so uh, you know if 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 i say that you know water uh, and i'm a sweet lover okay i have a big sweet tooth how much ever tummy full i am you give me a chocolate i have space for that in my tummy that's yeah. how work is yeah. so you add on new work to me i'm very happy to take so don't feel shy of asking ask for more hmm. as i said remember this dialogue patti to patti varna rakhi ready right. downside kuch nahi hai na tumhara what does that mean in uh, patti to patti matlab tumko kisi ko propose karna hai you want uh. to propose to a girl keep her rakhi rakhi hota na uh, raksha right. bandhan wala right, rakhi right, uh. keep it handy okay and if she was you know she's very tempted to slap you then you say <laughs> that you mistook her to be another and that's your rakhi ready uh, that's the movie dil in uh, which the cast was amir khan okay. so that's the dialogue that's what he which, did yeah that's what he <laughs> did you know because he was the flashy guy <laughs> till he fell in love whatever so keep that ready there's no downside downside right. kya hai if you don't try you will not get it hmm. it's as simple as that right So you took that six month sabbatical to kind of uh, figure out what you want to do. No, next. I didn't take a sabbatical. Then? When I was going to Kotak from Credence, I told them I am going to last in Kotak only for six months. So treat this as a six month sabbatical. Ah, okay, I can't okay. take sabbaticals. That's I a nice know. option. Huh? Yeah. When you tell your existing company that treat this as a sabbatical, I want to try something different. Absolutely. If it doesn't work out, I'll come back here. Absolutely, this is nice. and yeah. they were more than happy to take me back. So mm. that's how it is. Right. 
But that yeah. was on a more lighter way. But the thing is that you have to be constantly re-innovate yourself. You hmm. have to constantly be at the cutting edge of new technology. Very, very important. How do you do that? Being constantly? By reading, by upgrading my skill sets. Hmm. You have to make yourself relevant. You know, what should be your biggest fear? When I wake up tomorrow, will my job be with me? Will I be worthy of my job? Hmm. Will a robo be doing my job? Hmm. I think that's something you have to be there always. And that should be your biggest paranoia. Hmm. If you are not paranoid about your existence, you become complacent. Hmm. And when you become compla complacent, you are a potato. Right. Couch potato, as I would call it. Right. And they have their space and you know what, they're all. Let me just go to the rapid fire section. Uh, what do you think about Finfluencers? Ah, oh, they're good, they're bad, they're ugly. Yeah, okay. All, all three. All right. Uh, would you, uh, what do you think of uh, renting versus buying a home? Uh, one, buying is okay. Everything else should be rent out. One so, ownership is okay. Okay, one ownership is okay and not more multiple houses. Yeah. All right. And, but, and just to take that thought uh, deeper, when do you think is the right time to buy a house for people? Whenever you have money. Whenever you have money. And what is that for the, for the down payment you mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. You can leverage at your age, as right. in that's not a problem. But yeah, and make sure that you pay it back. Got it. You're the bankers running after your house. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest financial mistake that you have made? I thought uh, insurance was an investment product. Okay. Back okay. in my twenties, okay. the biggest mistake I did. Right. Uh, what is your fire number? The meaning the uh, retirement number. Is there like a number that you have in terms of wealth, uh, which will be considered as okay? If I have so much money, I don't have to never work for a day in my life. No, I'm not going to retire. Yeah, but let's say if you uh, had to say a number. No, as I said, uh, it's it's enough to take care of. Uh, you know, the day the way I do it is, you know, I uh, uh, spend hundred bucks per month. Hmm. So for the next thirty years, if I do nothing, is my kitty enough to take care of hundred bucks? That's the way I look at it. Got it. And, and I take earnings not even at 12-13%. Hmm. I take earnings at 5%. Hmm. That's my number. Got it. Because markets are the way they are, right? So right. that's the number. Which I, it's a very, very conservative estimate, but that helps you hmm. to keep going on and on. Right. I don't want to stop. Got it. And last question. What is the one purchase that wasn't a good financial decision, but you bought it anyway? Gold. Gold. Like You mean jewelry? Yeah, jewelry and then right. diamonds. Right. I, I th they say diamonds are what women's, women's best, friend. best friend. I don't right. know. My best friend is obviously I see uh, uh, money compounding and doubling in a span of five, six years. I think that's my best friend. Got it. All right. So now let's take up some audience questions, which were already sent by you guys. We have handpicked four uh, questions. And of these questions we have picked um, uh, based on which is the most commonly asked question and which is the most uh, relevant question for today's times. So let's begin. Uh, first question is uh, from a uh, person called Pratusha GS. Uh, it's natural that sometimes we derail from main track. Do you have any such experience and how do you manage to get back on track? Yeah, yeah. So many times you're all human beings, right? We right. continuously, uh, you know, so every time uh, in a block of five years, I used to get at least two offers from outside and the market is a you know financial services space uh, if you do reasonably well or if you are average to maybe above average you don't need to be exceptional and I don't claim myself to be exceptional above average is okay uh, you always get offers and uh, I almost got tempted to sign up on one uh, and uh, as, as good luck would have it, uh, you know, I had people around me to explain to me why. I, I, and I say almost because I was not very sure. Hmm. So I was almost derailing myself. And then, and then I realized... What, what, uh, what caused it, the almost derailing? Almost derailed because they were paying me obscene money. Okay. And this I'm okay. talking about 15 years back. And okay. obscene is another statement. So I said, uh, uh, Lakshmi and more Lakshmi, though, it's always a lethal combination. So I said, let's go in for it. And then I realized that uh, what do you do with this kind of money? And, and this I thought 15 years back, okay, yeah. not today. Uh, I have to compound my wealth at, uh, as I said, I need to double my money in a block of five to six years. And if I continue the game plan or what I'm doing, I think I'll get to there. So why do I uh, uh, kill the hen, you know, that gives the golden egg? Hmm. Uh, the gold might be less glittering, but that's okay with me. Yeah, hmm. so yeah, I've had my, those fool or kaate mein, these are those kaate moments. Got it, got it. All right. So from uh, so KT Ganesh is asking, most people say to allocate 50 to 60 percent in the stock market. Can we simply believe the stock market and invest? Should I be worried about concentration of risk? And do you think artificial intelligence will make investing in equity pointless 
since they will predict the movement yes no not at all all of these uh, firstly as i said there's no one size fits all yeah. so don't go by the 50 60 70% allocation uh, if you have risk capital for example you might be age of 30 uh, but you're getting married next month and then you need to buy a house the second month yeah. then equity should be a lower proportion of your portfolio but if you believe that you are 30 you're already married you have a kid you already have a house you have a mortgage whatever and you have a running stream of income then let it be 75 80% that doesn't matter mm, right uh, second is um, artificial intelligence has to be used as an enabler to the decision making it cannot substitute the decision making process so keep that in mind uh, and uh, equities is clearly a way to compound your wealth but not in one day one week one month one year but over the next 5 years 10 years 15 years so keep right. that longevity in mind and then you don't get disturbed by noises makes sense uh, next question is at what stages in one's financial journey uh, would you recommend investing directly in bonds well you can do that at any stage in life but uh, you need to be aware of what kind of risk if uh, i issue a bond i am the company for example and you are giving me money you have to be confident apart from earning a return on your capital there has to be a return of capital so the money which you give me you have to be confident that i'll be pay you back there are many such crooks in the country who've taken your money and just run away right hmm. so therefore bond market investing direct bonds is only for those who understand the basic color of the balance sheet if you don't know it please go for mutual funds i think that's a better mm. way to uh, you know that mutual funds right. absolutely absolutely uh, also the i think the question has become relevant today because um, uh, because of the recent uh, announcement about the taxation of debt mutual fund right so people are perhaps uh, thinking uh, if i want to get more returns out of my debt instruments why not i directly purchase the bond of that company Uh, which is in the double digit returns and if it's a double digit returns no fd can beat it mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is first is the concentration risk because you're giving it to one company as compared to a debt mutual fund which is distributed across multiple companies yeah. and uh, second is the fact that uh, there is a high um, what is a high chances of uh, no i don't know that's the one risk mm -hmm. yeah but what do you think about that uh so i'll give you yeah, a foodie uh, uh, the second the second problem is it's a high ticket size of it's course. like 1 lakh or 2 lakh minimum to purchase a bond yeah. so can you uh, so that's a lesser of an evil but let's solve for the first part and i'll give you a foodie example i love rasgullas okay now you infuse a lot of sugar syrup into your rasgulla and see the taste huh. and you just squeeze it off uh, the 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 sugar syrup and then try it you you know you need to ask a rasgulla lover how depressed he or she will feel to eat the latter okay but the point is that the health hazard the chances of a diabetes get further stoked with the former with having more of sugar syrup same is true for these double dig uh, digit yielding bonds now you do not know the extent of sugar syrup that is infused or the mm. amount of coating that's done to give you that return so if you are fully able to say that you know i understand this risk and i'm willing to back this risk please go for it mm But if you're already diabetic, dude, even that rasgulla with the sugar squeezed is like a luxury for you. Hmm. So be very, very wary of what kind of investments you are doing. And trust me, and mark my words, with this recent taxation change, you will find many fly-by-night operators trying to peddle these kind of strategies. I'm using hmm. my words very consciously. Don't fall prey to it. Hmm. because you may not do it all as i said ikea diy is not for everyone it's not certainly for me so i don't know how many uh, you know of you would fall in that category so be very careful there is a democratization which is a cutting down of this 1 lakh 2 lakh ticket size via a 5000 rupee ticket size into hmm. a diversified offering called the mutual fund debt schemes yeah why can't you use it yeah as i said if you understand it's a very very well researched high quality corporate go for it if it's a public sector you know a government of india entity which is issuing the bond go for it these uh, you don't have to worry uh, you know endlessly about will you get your money back will he or she go and settle in london and my money doesn't come back you don't have to worry about all those things mm. so i would say choose your battles wisely this is not the battle you should really worth you know it's not really worth fighting for this one got it the last question is from rahul singh Uh, we've seen that uh, most western economies have faced a lot of uh, problems mm -hmm. uh, in their stock market over, over the past few months uh, but india is not as much affected as uh, what most economists predicted it would be 
uh, why do you think that happened and going forward do you think india is um, kind of uh, un- going to be still remain unaffected by what's happening in the global economy see i don't think uh, india needs to behave uh, like uh, you know there's a saying which says begani shaadi mein abdullah diwana which means somebody else is getting married and somebody else is dancing that's what it means and why i say that is because what has happened in the us or what has happened in the europe is not because of bad lending it is because that they had very short term money and they invested it for very long term and mm. suddenly those investments witnessed a loss mm. and then when the depositors needed your money you had to sell this investment at a loss and give back the money right talking about svb right that's right. right where do you see that situation in india indian balance sheets or indian banks i would say are one of the highest um, uh you know sitting on highest uh, pots of capital which is the monies uh, which protects or which is a cushion hmm. i call it the suraksha kavach you know it will protect you against as a depositor or as an investor it protects you against all these anomalies so i think it's an isolated case which uh, the authorities there have reasonably taken care of it uh, it's like the crime scene you know the bollywood police coming at the end moment but for whatever reason at least they've come and solved for the situation right so i don't think we need to get overtly carried away psychological impact was there we've already seen and incremental such episodes you will see but you just have to hold your heart, hand close to your heart and keep telling yourself all is well i think that's very important right all right guys with that note let's wrap up today's uh, podcast i hope you guys enjoyed the last 2 uh, hours of our discussion and uh, let us know uh, what any feedback that you have keep please keep posting in the community about what you learned and what other things that you could have uh, learned from this podcast or any upcoming podcast and also give us some recommendations of any uh, particular guest that you would like us to invite and we'll try our best to bring them all right thank you so much uh, all right, lakshmi ayer and uh, please say bye to our audience all that right. that one that one oh that yeah. one okay yeah. bye see you and have a great weekend uh, i know everyone is in high spirits so yeah have fun bye see you